We will discuss about massive hemoptysis. This is also known as life-threatening hemoptysis. So hemoptysis is one of the most common symptoms of the respiratory diseases. And it's defined as the expulsion of the blood through the oral tract from a source located in the lower respiratory tract. And that is below the level of the glottis. So massive hemoptysis can be defined uh, as a blood loss that exits more than 600 ml in 24 hours or 150 ml per hour. According to the up-to-date, about 150 ml of the blood expected state in the 24 hours is considered as a massive hemoptysis or a bleeding at a rate more than 100 ml per hour is all, can be considered as massive hemoptysis. However, there is no universally accepted definition. So because of this, uh, nowadays we use the magnitude of effect definition of the massive hemoptysis. So according to this definition, hemoptysis requiring transfusion, hospitalization, intubation, or causing aspiration and airway obstruction, hypoxemia, or death can be considered as the massive hemoptysis. And uh, rather than using the term massive hemoptysis, life-threatening life -threatening hemoptysis is the preferred term nowadays. Usually this massive hemoptysis is related to the pathologies that alter the pulmonary vasculature, usually affecting the bronchial arteries. They are the high pressure blood vessels. And it is important to identify the patients with massive hemoptysis or who are at risk of high, high risk of developing massive hemoptysis because airway obstruction and hypoxemia uh, from the asphyxiation can immediately lead to the death. And rarely hemodynamic disturbance or shock because of the massive hemoptysis can also lead to the death. So even a tiny vessel rupture can cause significant clinical consequences because of the aspiration. And uh, it's very difficult for the thrombus to form at a very thin wall here. Where, so there's a, uh, always a risk of massive hemoptysis even with the rupture of the small vessels. So while discussing about the massive hemoptysis, it's always important to differentiate it from the pseudo hemoptysis, uh, which usually occurs because of the bleeding from the digestive tract or from the upper respiratory airways or upper or the oral cavity. So we need to differentiate it from the hemoptysis. Talking about the epidemiology, approximately 4.8 to 14 percent of the patients who develop hemoptysis tend to develop massive hemoptysis. So where does blood come from in the massive hemoptysis? So most of the times, in the 90 percent of the cases, the bleeding occurs from the high pressure bronchial circulation and in the remaining 5% it's from the pulmonary vessels and the remaining 5% occurs from the other arterial sources like aorta or from the non-bronchial uh, systemic circulation like from the intercostal arteries, coronaries or even from the phrenic arteries. So let's move to the pathophysiology. So there are basically two major pathways for the massive hemoptysis. So number one is bleeding from the bronchial arteries. So usually the best bleeding occurs in the background of the other uh, other diseases, like uh, any disease that causes hypoxic vasospasm spasm of the pulmonary circulation, uh, leads to the increase in the blood supply from the bronchial circulation. So when there are anastomosis uh, or neovascularization or anastomotic blood vessels, they tend to rupture because of the high pressure. So that is one pathophysiology. And next is, it can occur from the pulmonary circulation as well, usually in cases of the hydrogenic injuries during catheterization or due to the aneurysm rupture or from some other causes. So, so talking about the etiologies of the massive hemoptysis, so most common cause is bronchiectasis now globally. Previously, tuberculosis was a leading cause, but tuberculosis is still a most common cause of hemoptysis in the, some countries like China, and some other poor countries. So other causes include the tumors. It could be primary or metastatic tumor, cystic fibrosis, or can occur due to pulmonary artery pseudoaneurysms, aspergillomas or mycetomas, other long abscesses. So in the few slides, uh, we'll learn about the comprehensive list of causes for the massive hemoptysis. Actually, all the causes of hemoptysis can cause massive hemoptysis. So every patient who presents with a massive hemoptysis, uh, I mean to say with hemoptysis, uh, should be observed for the worsening of the condition. So basically the causes include the infectious causes like fungal infection, glyphsella, pseudomonas, 
or even some parasitic infections like paragonemiasis that can cause a massive hemoptysis. Similarly, neoplastic causes like bronchogenic carcinoma, pulmonary metastasis, sarcoma can cause massive hemoptysis. Similarly, there are other cardi cardiovascular and the pulmonary causes like bronchial artery aneurysm, airway vascular fistula or chronic bronchitis can cause massive hemoptysis. Similarly, some hematological disorders like coagulopathy or uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura can cause massive hemoptysis. Similarly, some drugs and toxins like penicillamine, crack cocaine, nitrofurantoin, or even some vasculitic diseases like good pastor syndrome, HSP, rheumatoid arthritis, SLD, necrotizing vasculitis, they can cause the massive hemoptysis. Similarly, sometimes the trauma, which could be hydrogenic or due to the accidental trauma, like blunt or penetrating chest injury, bronchoscopic uh, trauma during the bronchoscopic biopsy, can also lead to the massive hemoptysis. And similarly, there can be some other miscellaneous causes, like it can occur because of the bronchiolithiasis, foreign body aspiration. So what we need to understand is every cause for hemoptysis is a potential cause for the passive hemoptysis. So the list is very comprehensive. However, we need to remember the most common causes of the massive hemoptysis. So now moving on to the diagnosis. The, so the most important thing is to diagnose that patient has a massive hemoptysis. If we ignore massive hemo, uh, ignore a patient with a hemoptysis and if that patient develops massive hemoptysis, there is always a high chance of mortality. So the first priority is to diagnose the massive hemoptysis and to stabilize the patient. So uh, once the patient is stabilized, then only we can proceed for the further diagnosis, the diagnostic tests, and the treatment. So if the site of the bleeding is known, uh, patients should be positioned in a such a way that the bleeding site should face down so that we can prevent aspiration to the normal lungs. And once the patient is stabilized, then if it's possible, we can take a detailed history and examination to identify the, to identify the underlying cause. And after that, the general blood test should be done, including ABO, RLs, uh, and uh, arranging the blood and cross-matching needs, and including and then we can do CBC, CMP, LFT, RFT, ABG. And also we need to look at the coagulation profile to rule out any possible bleeding diastasis. So after that, we can proceed with the imaging studies. Chest X-ray is usually not a preferred modality of imaging because it's, it has very poor diagnostic accuracy and detection of the bleeding. Yeah, is very poor. So the preferred um, one of the preferred investigation of choice is bronchoscopy, which could be the rigid bronchoscopy, or we can proceed with the fiber optic bronchoscopy. Bronchoscopy can detect up to uh, ninety percent of the cases of the bleeding, and the advantages of the bronchoscopy is that it doesn't require moving patient to the uh, different site. It can be performed easily within the ED. So it provides information about the patient's anatomy and in certain cases, it can facilitate the subsequent intervention. So it is a preferred choice for the diagnosis. However, CT scan can replace or complement the bronchoscopy. In some of the studies, CT scan has shown a uh, higher diagnostic yield in comparison to the bronchoscopy, but CT scan or bronchoscopy both can be used for the diagnosis of the massive hemoptysis. So CT scan uh, can indicate the site and cause of the bleeding. So usually there can be manifestations like ground glass infiltration or a pulmonary consultation. Uh, as well as CT scan will help us to identify the underlying diseases responsible for the bleeding. And it also permits the identification of the major architectural distortion in the case of the diffuse pathologies. So, and the next imaging modality which can add the diagnosis is CT angiography. Uh, it helps us to identify the origin of the bronchial arteries from the thoracic aorta and it facilitates the catheterization during the interventional angiography and during the arterial embolization. So uh, this picture shows the example of how bronchoscopy and CT scan get the diagnosis. You can see this uh, in A and B, it shows the X-ray and CT scan of the 59-year-old female patient who presented with the hemoptysis uh, with the and you can see that CT scan shows the bronchiectasis, whereas CT scan uh, sometimes fails, fails to identify the exact site of the bleeding. However, in this case, the bronchoscopy revealed the right lower low the source of the ble bleeding. And similarly, in this um, uh, picture C, you can see that in this CT scan, there is a diffuse involvement of the 
uh, lungs by the capitator lesions because of the mycetoma. And in this case, also CT scan uh, might not be able to find out the exact location of the bleeding. However, bronchoscopy was um, able to identify the right upper lobe as a cause of the bleeding. So in both the subjects, uh, they were stabilized by using the, uh, after intervention, uh, using the bronchial blockades before to the arterial embolization. And so this is why CT scan and bronchoscopy, they can complement each other in the diagnosis of the massive hemoptysis. And it's always important to decide which investigation should be done based on the patient's profile and the availability as well. So now let's move to the treatment. So the treatment basically has two aspects. One is the emergency arrest of the bleeding and then the subsequent management of the underlying uh, bleeding. So for the emergency arrest of the bleeding, rigid endoscopy can be done because rigid endoscopy uh, provides the uh, ease for the adequate aspiration of the blood. And through the rigid endoscopy, uh, other intervention like fibrotic bronchoscopy can be performed or intubation can be performed. So rigid bronchoscopy is very helpful in the initial stage of uh, in management of the massive hemoptysis. So patient the, and the actually usually the normal lungs should be intubated and usually the intubation is done with a large volume ET tube at least size 8 or more so that it will be easy for the subsequent procedures to be done because of the large lumen. And the after the intubation the site of the bleeding if identified should be uploaded it can be done by using the balloon, bronchial blockers, or flexible bronchoscope. Uh, in certain cases, endobronchial medical therapy can be used for the emergency arrest of the bleeding. Like we can, like ice, ice cold water irrigation can be done. Similarly, local injection of the epinephrine or norepinephrine during the bronchoscopy can be done. Similarly, using the local tolipression or depression can be used. Similarly, there's some evidence for the use of endobronchial installation of tranexamic acid. And in certain cases, if it's available, we can proceed with a thermal ablation, electrocautery, or laser photocoagulation for the treatment of the massive hemoptysis. And uh, recently, uh, there's some evidence that endoscopic installation of fibrinogen thrombin combination can help. In addition to that, we can also use hemostatic growth like uh, pituitrine, hemocoagulase, or some other forms of the hemostatic drugs can be used. So once the immediate uh, bleeding is controlled, and then the targeted treatment for the massive hemoptysis is necessary. And usually bronchial artery embolization is the first line and the preferred modality of the treatment. Uh, we'll talk about bronchial artery embolization in our subsequent slides. And if bronchial artery embolization could, uh, is uh, uh, not done or if there were any contraindication to that procedure, so in some cases we can go for the surgical treatment of the bleeding, which might include lobectomy. And usually surgical treatment it's not a first line treatment, but it's preferred in certain cases, like in cases of the iatrogen pulmonary artery rupture, chest trauma, or aspergillum are resistant to the other therapeutic options. And after after that, we have to treat the underlying cause because unless we treat the underlying cause, there is always a risk of recurrence of the massive hemoptysis. So there's a few other factors which we need to consider while uh, treating the patients with massive hemoptysis. So number one is coagulation parameters. If there's any bleeding diastasis, then we have to treat that. We have to check whether the patient is on any anticoagulant drugs or not. We have to check the number of pl uh, platelet number in the patients because that increases the risk of bleeding. Similarly, use of the antiplatelets and the presence of the renal failures should also be assessed while managing the patients with massive hemoptysis. So now let's talk um, in a little bit detail about the bronchial artery embolization. So this is the treatment of choice for the massive hemoptysis. And various techniques can be used for the bronchial artery embolization. Usually, a uh, cell use technique is used via the femoral route. Uh, usually, the bronchial arteries are catheterized and the contrast is injected. And usually, in cases of the massive hemoptysis, we can see the enlarged torsus vessels with intense angiographic blush in the parenchymal phase of the angiography. And this finding alone is uh, sufficient to justify the embolization of the artery because of this active extravasation of the contrast is only seen in the few cases. So we cannot, uh, so we don't need to see extravasation. 
And after localization of the vessel, embolic agents can be used for the embolization, like usually polyvinyl alcohol, coils, gelatin sponges, or embospheres are most commonly used. However, there are other agents which can also be used for the embolization. You can see in this picture, uh, it shows the enlarged and torsus vessel with the uh, intense uh, angiographic blast. So during the bronchial artery embolization, it's important to identify and embolize the bronchial artery that supplies to the responsible lobe. Otherwise, we won't be able to control the bleeding. But in cases of the diffuse pathologies, uh, embolization of all the identified pathologic vessels can be considered in case-by-case -case basis to prevent the future bleeding episodes. Uh, one thing we need to understand is because of the double vascularization of the pulmonary parenchyma, there is usually low risk of uh, ischemic complications. The success rate of uh, bronchial artery embolization is around 60 to 90 percent. However, there are a few rare complications which can occur after this procedure, like cortical blindness, tracheoesophageal fistula from the esophageal ischemia, bronchial stenosis, or necrosis from the bronchial wall ischemia, ischemic colitis, and pulmonary infarction. However, these complications are very rare. So, uh, uh, this picture shows the in bronchial artery before and after the embolization in a patient with a massive hemoptysis. And this is a summary of the management of the massive hemoptysis. You can go through this chart. So now talking about the prognosis of the massive hemoptysis, it's indicated by the various factors, like the amount of the blood in the sputum. If the amount of blood in the sputum is large, the prognosis is bad. Similarly, the rate of bleeding also important for the prognosis. Like if the mortality rate is more than 70% in the patients who are bleeding at the rate greater than 600 ml in four hours. Similarly, etiology of the hemoptysis is also an important consideration while discussing about the prognosis because if the hemoptysis is because of the underlying cancer, prognosis is not that good. Similarly, if the patient is hemodynamically unstable and if there is any delay in the initiation of the management of hemoptysis, prognosis can be bad. Usually the mortality rate in the recent studies is about 6.5 to 38 percent. So these are the references for this presentation. If you want to read in the details, you can go through these uh, references. Thank you so much uh, for taking your time to listen to me till now. So if you think this video was helpful, please like, share, comment, and subscribe to our channel for more videos. Thank you.